Now that we've seen what magnetic fields do, let's go back a little bit and see how magnetic fields are created. Fundamentally, magnetic fields come from moving electric charges. We've already seen that magnetic monopoles don't exist, or at least we've never found one. So all the magnetic fields that we do see do not come from magnetic monopoles. Understanding how this works was accomplished by James Clerk Maxwell, and it was the first unified field theory in physics. The theories of magnetism and electricity were united. Unified field theories have been kind of a holy grail of physics ever since. For the origin of magnetic fields, I'd like to begin with this law, the law of Bio and Safar. This provides a formula for the magnetic field created by a moving electric charge. It's rather complicated, so let's break it down. An electric charge Q, moving with velocity V, creates a magnetic field. This formula tells us the magnitude and direction of this magnetic field at some displacement R from this charge. In this formula, Q is the value of the charge, V is its velocity, R is the displacement vector, R hat is a unit vector in the same direction as r. By unit vector, I mean that its magnitude is just 1. This is being used for its direction, not for its magnitude. The mu naught constant is one of those fundamental constants of the universe. It essentially has the same place in magnetic theory as epsilon naught, the permittivity of free space, has in electric theory. So mu naught is known as the permeability, or the magnetic permeability, of free space. Its defined value used to be 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7 tesla meters per ampere. It now has a not defined value, now it has a measured value, which is essentially the same thing as 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7 tesla meters per ampere, but that can change as measurements become more accurate. Let's look at this formula right now very quickly to see what it tells us about the direction of this magnetic field at this field point. So if we're looking at this picture not as a perspective picture but just saying that the velocity is v in the plane of the screen and the displacement is r in the plane of the screen again. What's the direction of the magnetic field at this field point? Well it's the direction of the vector v cross r or v cross r hat. We can evaluate that. Point the fingers of your right hand in the direction of this vector v and then curl them so that they go toward the vector r and if you do that you'll see that your thumb is going to be pointing into the screen. So the magnetic field created by this moving charge at this point here is directed into the screen away from you. We can use this law of Bio and Safar to figure out what magnetic fields are in real situations. Most of the time it's pretty difficult, but let's look at one example where we actually can use it and it actually does make sense. And this is for a ring of current. So we imagine we have current flowing continually around the ring. This is not too unrealistic. We can, in reality, make some systems that are quite similar to this. We're going to use this law of Beyond so far to find out what the magnitude and direction of the field is at the center of this ring. We'll define the current itself, the magnitude of the current I, as it goes around the ring, and we'll define the radius R of the circle. I is the quantity of charge that moves past some point in this ring in a given period of time. It's simplest to think about the total quantity of moving charges in the ring itself, and then the delta T is going to be the time it takes to make one revolution. In other words, that delta T is the period of revolution of the charge carriers in this ring. L is the distance traveled by these charge carriers in this time delta T. So V is the speed at which the charge carriers move. I times L, the current times the length, is equal to QV. I is something that we'll usually be able to measure. QV is what shows up in the formula for the law of Bio and Zafar that I showed on the previous slide. Mu naught QV cross R hat divided by 4 pi R squared. A little bit of inspection shows us that this vector V is tangential and the vector R is radial. They're always going to be perpendicular to each other. The cross product is at its maximum value just the product of their magnitudes. Since the magnitude of vector r hat is 1, then the cross product of v cross r hat is just going to be the magnitude of v. What about the direction of v cross r hat? Well, the vector v is in the direction of the current. The vector r hat is from the ring to the center. So v cross r hat is going to be pointing out at you. 
q times v is i times l. So that's the substitution that we've done here. Also, the r squared in the denominator is equal to capital R squared, which is the actual radius that we've defined for this situation. L, the length of the segment of wire that we're considering, is the entire circumference of the ring. So that's going to be 2 pi r. So if we substitute that in, notice we have a factor of 2 pi r in both the numerator and the denominator, and we can factor that out. And we're left with the magnitude of the magnetic field at the center of this ring of charge is mu naught i divided by 2r. This magnetic field is directly proportional to the current. So as you increase the current, the magnitude of the magnetic field that it creates increases proportionally. Also, notice this is inversely proportional to r, so the bigger the ring, the smaller the field is going to be at the center, and that makes sense because it's farther away. In general, it's difficult to do analyses like this for more complicated systems. Here's a nice quote that I pulled off the internet. And what you basically find out is, except for the simplest of cases, such as this center of a ring of charge, it's unreasonably difficult to try to use this law of Beyond Safar, and there have to be other tricks that you use. And that's basically what it is, other mathematical tricks, which are beyond the scope of this course. So what instead I'll do is talk you through some of the formulas and some of the field patterns produced by different configurations of electric currents. So let's look at the prototype current system, which is a straight wire of current. It turns out that a straight wire of current creates a magnetic field that loops around the wire in a circular fashion, and it follows a right-hand rule of its own. This right-hand rule is that if you extend your thumb of your right hand in the direction of the current, the magnetic field around this wire is going to be in the direction that your fingers of your right hand naturally curl. You can see that this is completely consistent with what the law of Biot and Safar tells us. This magnetic field looks unlike any magnetic field that we've seen before. All the magnetic fields that we've seen before, for instance of magnets, have dipole fields. They have a north and a south pole. This does not have a north and a south pole. There is no north pole where the magnetic field lines come from, there is no south pole where the magnetic field lines converge to. They just cycle around. The direction of the current is down. You see all the compass needles are pointing around in a clockwise fashion. If you point your thumb in the direction of the current, the fingers of your right hand will naturally curl around in the clockwise fashion in the direction of the magnetic field. The magnitude of this magnetic field is just this formula, mu naught i over 2 pi r, where i is the current in the wire and r is the distance from the wire. So the magnitude of the magnetic field is inversely proportional to the distance from the wire. How about a current ring, which is more realistic because currents have to flow in circuits? We've already derived, using the law of Bio and Safar, the magnetic field at the center of a ring. The whole ring is going to be like we'd imagine if we took an infinite wire with the magnetic field looping around it and then we looped it around and it behaves pretty much as we'd imagine. The magnetic field is essentially going to be a torus around this wire. The magnetic field is going to be more intense at the center because the fields from the different parts of the wire are all going to reinforce there. Outside the wire, the magnetic field is going to be weaker because the magnetic field from the current going this way is going to be partially canceled by the magnetic field going the opposite way on the other side of the ring. This gives us a dipole field. There is a north magnetic pole at the top and a south magnetic pole at the bottom. I'm going to give a slightly more comprehensive formula than the one that we originally derived for right at the center of the ring. This is going to tell us the magnetic field at any point along the axis of the ring. Uh, we'll have the current I, we'll have, of course, the radius R of the ring, and we'll also define a distance X along the axis. So this distance X is going to be from the center of the ring, or from the plane of the ring, to the field point that's on the axis. This is a formula, mu naught I R squared over 2 R squared plus X squared to the 3 halves power. Here I is the current, R is the radius of the ring, and x is the distance from the center of the ring. 
I want to point out one thing about this, and that is how this dipole field behaves when you're far away from the ring. In other words, as x is much bigger than r, we can neglect the r squared term in the denominator, and this term essentially becomes x cubed. So when x is much bigger than r, where x is much greater than r, the field strength is inversely proportional to the cube of x. So when we have a dipole field, instead of being an inverse square dependency, it's an inverse cube dependency. And that's one of the fundamental differences between a dipole and a monopole field. A monopole field has an inverse square dependence. A dipole field has an inverse cube dependence. I want to point out one other thing about this. If you just substitute 0 for x in the formula in the previous slide, you get mu naught i over 2r. And this is the result that we got from the law of Biot and so far. Another current configuration that we use a lot in real life is the solenoid, where you have a number of loops in a helical fashion with current flowing through them. Turns out, if you have an infinite solenoid, then the field inside the solenoid is uniform. It's directed parallel to the solenoid axis, and the field outside the solenoid is going to be zero. In a real solenoid that does not have infinite in extent, it's going to be a fairly uniform field inside, a very low field outside, and there's going to be a fairly high field along the axis. This is a dipole looking field, a north pole on the left side with the magnetic field lines diverging from that end, and a south pole on the right side where the magnetic field lines are converging to. Right now, when there's no current flowing through the solenoid, the compass needle just points in the direction of the Earth's magnetic field. That will put a current of about one ampere through the solenoid. Now as soon as I do that, you see that the magnetic field changes. The compass is showing that the magnetic field is now pointing that way. In this position, hmm, now the magnetic field is pointing out. Here the magnetic field is pointing to the right, to the left, to the right. What about above the solenoid? Above the solenoid, it's pointing to the left. Inside the solenoid, the magnetic field is pointing to the right. That's true all the way through the inside. The magnetic field is quite strong inside. You can't see that. The formula for the field inside a solenoid is mu naught ni. It's very simple. I, of course, is I is just I is just the current. Interestingly, it's independent of the radius of the solenoid. That's all the configurations of currents in a wire that I want to tell you about. There's one last system that has a very important magnetic field that I want to talk about, and that's the electron. Electrons themselves are magnets. It turns out that an intrinsic property of electrons is their spin. They have an intrinsic angular momentum that leads to an intrinsic magnetic moment. Classically, we can think of it in the way that I'm about to describe. Quantum mechanically, it's not quite true, but in the end, the important thing is that the electrons have charge and they have angular momentum. This leads to a magnetic moment. Here's how that works. If we imagine this particular electron spinning in this direction, which is clockwise if you're looking down at it from the top of the slide, electrons are negative, so that means that the current is essentially going in the opposite direction, counterclockwise as you look down at it from the top. Using the right-hand rule, curling your fingers in the direction of the current tells you that the magnetic moment, the magnetic field at the center, should be pointing up. So this is the kind of magnetic field that we'd get from a spinning electron with a north and a south pole, and the magnetic moment is shown as the bold red arrow. This intrinsic property of electrons is where permanent magnets come from for the most part. So remember, we have two different types of magnets. We have electromagnets, which occur when you have an actual electric current moving through a conductor, and that sets up a field. And when you turn off the current, you've turned off the magnet. There are permanent magnets, which are always on, and these occur because they're made out of materials that have aligned electron spins. And there are enough electrons aligned in the same direction to create an overall magnetic moment of the material. But in all cases, for both these electromagnets and the permanent magnets, the fields are created by moving electric charges.